can I just open it up for any further discussion, questions, issues? What are, what are your questions? What are your diocesan considerations when it comes to diaconate? It's one of the questions that you need to wrestle with. What's the history behind the deacon? Say more on the question. That supports the deacon of the cup. Oh, okay. Um, do you mean that the deacon is the one who ministers the cup and liturgically? <coughs> right. And, and by the way, I should thank you because I should mention this. I must say that one of the most poignant moments liturgically as deacon is at the conclusion of the anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, at the great elevation. When priest and deacon, side by side, elevate the, the body and blood of Christ. And that's the elevation proper in the liturgy, right? You have the showing earlier, but then this is the great elevation. And I think liturgically, what you get there is the full image of Christ. In the person of Christ, the head, and the priest. And in the person of Christ, the servant, and the deacon. Fully embodied. Raising the offering to the Father. And as deacon, I often experience that as the most powerful moment of the liturgy. Because often, at that moment, what comes to mind, the Holy Spirit brings to mind, are all sorts of people for whom I said I would pray. That I don't need prayer. It's a great intercession. That they're being offered up to the Father in that moment, in that cup of salvation and suffering at the same time. That's a very moving. Sometimes I just I, I begin to choke up in that moment. Yes, I know that historically it probably arose from the fact that the cups, the main chalices liturgically, were large, two-handled, heavy affairs, and the deacon was the guy, the gopher, who would come over and pick it up while the priest elevated the, the, the body. You know? I know that. Just as the commingling of water and wine had certain practical prop, maybe. Nonetheless, these things take on a life and a, and a theological meaning. The, the, the idea that the priest then, uh, even though the, fra the fracturing rite is something the deacon is proper to, to take, distribute the Eucharist from, the idea that, that, the, that the deacon, flowing from that liturgical act, then ministers the cup, has taken root. It's not a strict mandate, and I don't, I don't read the germ, even though it's the English translation of the germ would strongly suggest that it's proper to the deacon to only administer the cup. It, it's actually a little bit odd, I think, liturgically, to have the priest distributing the body, and then the deacon with one of the cups, and have another, a lay person distributing the body. There's something a little bit odd about that. That's what the UCCB says we're supposed to do. However, that's why I asked you the history behind that because yeah. there's some symbol there that's the reason why he's there. I don't think the USCCB does say, what, show me the source. Ah, it was online where I read it. Show, but, show, me, show me the source. Yeah. It, I don't, it's not a, it's not a return, it's not, a, it's not in the journal. And, and USCCB, uh, Office of Liturgy, is not inclined to make norms. Although one could interpret the germ that way. And I've consulted other liturgists on this and debated. Here's another one. Should the deacon ever actually lift the chalice himself from the altar? And depending on how one interprets it several different places, yes and no. But my pastor, my bishop, always wants me to pick up the chalice. However, the deacon should not self-communicate like a priest. So when the chalice is on the altar, we're having mass tomorrow, and the priest, I'm presuming many will can celebrate. The priest will receive, self-communicate from the altar. The deacon always receives the chalice from the presider. It's just little things like this uh, in learning. Uh, the deacon, when the priest stands to say the Our Father, how does this? How does the Priest stand. Priest, right? How does the deacon stand? Right. 
unless you're in a parish where everybody does this. <laughs> and, and so they, when the Rome kind of do as the Romans, but he, even, when, even in those situations, I always bring my hands together because the priest goes into the embolism in that presidential Moran's position and the deacon does not. So I always bring my hands back together. The germ doesn't specify how one should hold one hand, number one. However, the ceremonial bishops does. And a lot of things we do liturgically, and liturgical law is interpreted according to a series of sources. And I would argue that it's more proper to fold one hand like this, right? Because that's what the ceremonial bishops indicate. And it's the standard posture within the sanctuary, wherever the deacon, especially in the procession, has hands folded even during the proclamation of the gospel. The deacon should not say, the Lord be with you. Well, these are boring nuances, aren't they? You had talked about some resources or books or different things that we can use. I know some of them you have up there, but is there a place where we could go to find your list or some list recommended for formation? Yes. Um, I have a couple here. And, and, and I, I, other than the directories, the two main sources I'd recommend, uh, the International Theological Commission's document, it's entitled From the Diaconate of Christ to the Diaconate of the Apostles, which is actually the title of the first chapter. This is being retranslated right now by a fellow in Scotland. Um, he's doing a lovely job of it. Uh, so this is, I, I would say this is must reading, especially for formators. Uh, Bill Dykwig's book, Deacon Bill Dykwig's, on the emerging diaconate, will give you all that history I was giving and much more, plus trends in the United States diaconate. I don't agree with everything that Bill advocates for here, but he, he raises the issues well and gives good history and some nice theology. I do have a list. I could email that to you. Uh, a lot of those resources are available online. Some of them are books that are being published. Not all of which is totally, some of it's passe already, but that's all right. Yes? What about the placement of the deacon and the sanctuary? We have a church with a lot of space up there, very limited space, and we have a church with a lot of uh, Great question. If this were the altar, celebrant, proper place for the deacon is Deacon's always secondary. Off to the side, and step back. Okay. The germ is very clear that the deacon should not be between the presider and concelebrants. And at the same time, the deacon should not be impeded from being able to perform his duties at the side of the, at the main celebrant. It's a great Catholic both and. Right? So, um, the deacon needs to learn the art of pushing and celebrating bishops aside, which I had to do in Dublin and other places. Yeah, I mean, the deacon really should be at the side because he, if, if, you know, if, if the presider wants a patent or a pall, uh, be able to elevate the chalice and to be able to handle anything that happens. Right. And you have four concelebrants. You have two concelebrants up there and one and the deacon on the side and the concelebrants on the side. I would argue the deacon ought to be right next to the cellar. That's, he's he's got to be able to do what he's meant to do. The concelebrants could be on the side. You know. Generally, we try to do it so I'm not standing between me and the concelebrants. But even in a small space, you do what you have to do. But I, I should... Same thing seated. The deacon should always be seated to the celebrant's right. The deacon should be seated to the bishop's right. We should have two deacon chaplains and then deacon, active deacon to further to his right. I'm the right hand man of the bishop. Yes? Oh, pragmatic question about assigning deacons. I think you 
mentioned is not assigning them to their home parish or which they came from. Uh, in this diocese, we have some uh, problematic things. If we had a deacon out of Harrison, where would we assign him uh, except to Harrison? Because right. it's so far away from anywhere else. And a lot of them would come up from, especially our rural parishes, that's where their livelihood is too. Right. That's where they work. Right. And to say, well, you've got to drive 50 miles. To yeah, I, I wouldn't do that in your diocese. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying that in my diocese, our archbishop has decided to go with that policy. That's not a norm. Nationally, would the majority would say, right, the parents say, we're up It's hard to say, but I say, especially in rural dioceses, most deacons would be assigned to the parish they came from. But if you have, uh, say, in Grand Island, maybe even in North Platte, you've got a few parishes. You might have a parish that has three deacons and one that has none. Mm -hmm. I would be, if you're the bishop, you know, I'd be very easy. Look with you, whoever your consultors are, to make a prudential <laughs> decision, should we have a deacon? And, and, and in our diocese, it will depend on where, where they live and where they work. So, so that the bishop would take into account, the assignment board takes into account a lot of factors. And we had some, I've argued with, you argued in an obedient way. That <laughs> 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 there should be exceptions to that policy. And the Archbishop has just been very adamant, no, especially on the first assignment. However, he's assigned a few men to like little parish clusters that would include the parish he came from, in part to meet family needs or work needs. So he's very, he's very cognizant of practical, pragmatic issues. Thanks. Helps. Yes. Can a deacon celebrate a communion service in the absence of the priest? Yes. And, and all things being equal, he should over a lay person. Because he, he's an ecclesial minister. He, he has the apostolic presence and he can give the blessing. Yes. A deacon run for public office. A deacon may run for public office by canon law, but it's up to the bishop, the ordinary, to decide whether or not. In other words, he needs permission. Our archbishop bishop recently made a blanket policy that no deacons are allowed to run for public office. There aren't many who will anymore. But you can see, uh, there's some out east, I know it was a couple of deacon judges, for instance. But you do need permission. I think it becomes a, uh, increasingly it's a uh, formation issue. We, we had a guy applying who mainly, as part of his work, does a political blog. And that may be an issue. It's uh, very clear, um, and, and I, I didn't read to you some quotations from John Paul, maybe I should have, his words are more eloquent. A deacon is not a layman. There's no such thing as a part-time deacon. A deacon is deacon 24-7. Um, and John Paul says, it makes no sense to think about a part-time deacon. What is that? You can't be a part-time priest. You were ordained. So a deacon, we need to be aware that a deacon's life needs to conform to being ordained. And the Congregation for Clergy survey indicates this, John Paul indicates this, if anything, it's the deacon's employment that must bend to fit diaconate, not diaconate to fit his employment. That's a discernment factor within your application and formation process. John Paul says that deacons is not a profession, it's a vocation. So I, because I'm married and a father, I'm a father and a deacon 24-7. When I'm standing at the altar, I'm there as a father and a husband and deacon. And if you'll permit me to use the expression, when I make love to my wife, I'm a deacon. I don't cease being a deacon in that moment. 
I was telling some of the candidates or applicants last night, my kids get this. Kids are great, because they, they cut right through the theology so quickly. It's practical. <laughs> my kids get this theology, because they'll say to me, Dad, you're not acting very much like a deacon right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm losing my patience, you know? They, they, they don't call me on, you're not being a, you know, like a, a holy father. Or, you know. No, you're not being a deacon. They get it. Real quick. And when I, was, when I was discerning, I asked my children explicitly, my older two, what would you think about dad being deacon? I've already, I was already, already in full-time ministry, and I've, already, I've always lived an odd schedule, being away at nights and weekends. The 13 years I've spent, I've missed most of college football on Saturdays. And my kids are used to that. And they said, well, would it mean you'd be away even more? I said, sometimes. And they said, well, we don't think you should do that. I said, what do you think if God wants me to do it? Oh, then you should do it. <laughs> That'll, that'll be a sacrifice, but you should do it. But it, it's hard. I'm, I'm away for three days right now. I'll go back, teach a course. I'll get back Wednesday night, but I won't see smoke until Thursday morning. I teach a class Thursday night. Friday, there's an event in the parish. My son can come with me. It's a vocations night. Saturday, we have another event in the parish, just my wife and I will go to. Sunday, we have a group of folks coming over to our house. That's, that's a sacrifice. I'm waiting for my kids to get old enough they can travel with me at things like this. And I've done that for a couple of things, my older ones. I, I would say that for married people, and I'm going to say more about marriage and wives tomorrow, but one of the real keys is trying to learn how to integrate married life, family life, and diaconate. Now, on a very practical level, I think including my family in my diaconate ministry to the degree I can has really made a big difference. It's a way of evangelizing my children. But they, they get to be with me and I get to be with them. And we pray the liturgy of the hours together as a family, uh, periodically. We don't, we actually don't do it as much now because their schedules are crazier as they're into sports and dance. But we still, especially on the weekends, and my, my kids, my youngest can't, she's only five because she can't read yet. But the, from the eight-year-old up, they can lead the liturgy of the hours. In fact, they fight over it. You know? <laughs> Let's pray, kids. My turn to leave. No, it's not. You're not doing that. No, you're not. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray here now. No, I should have done that. You're the worst parents in the world. <laughs> well, that's a good prayer. Huh? <laughs> uh, yes. In any reference to the worldwide survey of permanent deacons in 2009. Is there an executive summary of that or any published conclusion? Because it asks some really strange questions. Yeah, no, I have not seen a survey of that or a, a summary. I don't, it went to the Congregation for Clergy, as you remember, so they have not divulged that that I'm aware of. Do you, do you, do you wish to say anything about what you thought was Interesting or strange? Well, yeah. I thought they asked some uh, odd questions such as how many of your permanent deacons have abandoned the faith? How many of your permanent married deacons are now divorced? How do you handle a, a divorcing permanent deacon? There were lots of, to me, they were odd questions rather than concentrate on the essence, the center, the centrality of the permanent diaconate they were asking about is one case at a time are real unusual or rare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, here's the survey right here. It's 31 questions. My read of it is, remember this is a worldwide survey. Right. Um, and 
there are some dioceses that are more or less, like Chicago. Chicago has over 600 deacons. They have several people working full time overseeing the life of the deacons. Although Bob Bohala, the director there, will say somewhat jokingly, we have 100 deacons, we don't know where they are. <laughs> And he's, he's somewhat joking, but he's also lamenting the fact that things were kind of sloppy, you know, in an earlier generation. Well, if you've got a hundred deacons and you don't even know where they are, and these are ecclesial ministers governed by canon law, sacramental ministers of the church. Truly, God only knows what they're doing and what they're up to, and the scandal that could be in the Heart. And I think the Congregation for Clergy is both concerned to get a, a, a better profile of how are we forming men in terms of their self-understanding, but also on a practical level, are there problem areas? And uh, I think some of those questions, most of us would say, gee, that's just not an issue. But there are some that I think in some parts of the world are issues. And that's what they're trying to get a feel for. And I, my suspicion is that this is going to inform whatever documents come out as we're expecting. But here's another reason that we're expecting that something's going to be issued. The directory, which was promulgated at the end of 2004, had a five-year recognitio. Then they asked, which was renewed in 2009. Then they said, prepare for another five-year recognitio in a second edition. So we started doing a survey of all the deacon directors around the country. What little changes would we make? What changes did the bishops want? And then we got word from the prefect for congregation for clergy. Why don't you just hold off on that? We're not, we're not going to ask. We're just, we'll give you another recognition if we need to. And just hold off. So we think there's something coming. In defense of the deacons in Chicago, they, they're missing about 200 priests, too, that they don't know where they are. <laughs> How many are we missing? <laughs> Shall we end there then? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's good for